Good afternoon from London, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ivanka Barzashka and I'm the Managing Director of the King's Wargaming Network. Thank you for joining us for our public lecture series on advancing wargaming as an academic discipline. And I'm pleased to welcome today Dr. Jacqueline Schneider, who is joining us live from Stanford, California. Um, I'm pleased to see that we had about 300 viewers registered uh, by Eventbrite for this lecture. We have uh, also people joining us via our, our YouTube feed. Um, thank you very much for, um, for uh, joining us today. What we're doing at King's with, with these public lectures is um, advancing fundamental research in wargaming. Um, and this is part of an effort to build the epistemological and methodological foundations of wargaming as a social science. And we have invited Dr. Schneider um, today because of her work, uh, which has advanced wargaming methods. It demonstrates how war games can be designed as social science experiments, uh, but it also demonstrates how longitudinal analysis uh, can be applied to war gaming. And, and that's how we can analyze data from games that are played over an extended period of time. So using these innovative methods, our speaker has shed light on important international security questions. So these are questions at the intersection of cybersecurity and, and nuclear weapons, uh, which are of interest to both policymakers uh, and scholars uh, here at the School of Security Studies at King's College London, but also at, at other universities. And we see that in, in, the, in, in the audience today, uh, we have people joining in from both uh, the, the policy and, and the academic communities uh, to welcome Dr. Jacqueline Schneider. Uh, she is a Hoover Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and a non-resident fellow at the Naval War College's Cyber Innovation Policy Institute. Her research focuses on the intersection of technology, national security, and political psychology with a special interest in cybersecurity, unmanned technologies, and Northeast Asia. She has also been an active member of the defense policy community uh, with previous positions at the Cybersecurity, uh, Cyberspace Solarium Commission, the Center of American Security, and the RAND Corporation. Uh, and before embarking on her academic career, she had spent six years as an Air Force officer in South Korea and Japan, and she's still uh, currently a reservist. And I'm particularly delighted to welcome Jackie today because uh, we at King's have called for analytical wargaming to become more scientific. And scientific means being systematic, public, and rooted in worldly knowledge. And, and this is, you know, we see this as essential if wargaming is to inform national security and defense policy. And, and Jackie's work is an excellent demonstration of the values of scientific wargaming in practice. So we're, we're very pleased to have her today. Um, just before I hand it over to her, some, um, uh, some points on the rules of engagement. We encourage you to ask questions after the talk. Uh, please pop those in to the Q and A um, icon that you will see at the lower right hand on side on your screen, and I'll I'll ask the speaker those those questions in in order. Thank you, and and welcome, Jackie. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here with you today. Um, I really want to say I'm an extraordinary admirer of what Ivanka and her team have built at King's College. And so it's wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to speak to this audience um, and this community that I really think Ivanka, you have helped um, build. So thank you for that. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on with my co-authors, uh, Rachel Schaefer and Ben Schechter, both from the Naval War College. We've been working on this project for about three years. Now, any of you who are doing wargaming within the practitioner community know that the ability to run one war game for three years <laughs> is a very, very rare uh, privilege. And I think that's something that um, academia really brings to this uh, discussion because we are able to stare at a problem for a really, really long time. 
um, which allows us to do some really cool things when it comes to thinking about iteration, thinking about generalizability, thinking about building samples and controlling. Um, and so that's really, um, I think, one of the kind of primary methodological innovations that we're trying to present in this work. The other thing that we're trying to do, so this, I'll speak more about it once we get into the game series, but this game series has been run with over 580 participants and 13 different locations over two and a half years. Um, and it is one of the larger games that has been iterated this many times. I think Signal has been iterated more. Signal started right at the same time as us. Um, and so games, game series like what we're working on or what the Signal game series is doing is also having to think about what are the methodological foundations that we need to develop when thinking about what makes war games good or bad. And in my community, in the academic community, um, there are very clear um, beliefs about how to do the best kind of um, survey experiments, for example. And so uh, we know um, what is expected about publishing data, about reviewing data, and then presenting data. And this is a little bit new for wargaming. So I want to highlight that the first thing that we have done for this wargaming series is actually publish all of the materials that we've used in the game design, um, from data collection to scenario design to um, the entire gaming methodology. And this is in simulations and gaming. So if you're interested, um, or if you wanna run the game again, or if you wanna you know, change the game to see if different changes create different outcomes, we have published that for the good of the community um, on simulations and gaming. So what we're presenting here is the main thrust of this kind of research initiative. So it is broadly looking at cyber operations and nuclear use. Now, why cyber operations and nuclear use? Well, I, I would be remiss if I did not start this presentation with a reference to Matthew Broderick and the War Games movie, because it's like a requirement if you're doing cyber and nuclear. Uh, so for those of you who are not as old as me, um, there was this lovely uh, movie in the 80s about, um, you know, a, Matthew Broderick, who is kind of like a student who accidentally hacks into strategic command, and all of a sudden we have the you know, Soviet Union and the U.S. about to go to war with one another. And the interesting thing about this movie is that while you know it's an evocative and, and fun movie, it it actually had ended up having policy implications because Reagan watched the movie and he said, "Wait, could something like this happen to us?" Um, and so he launched the very first cyber vulnerability um, exploration. And so ever since then, cyber and nuclear have been inextricably linked, at least in the United States. And you know, if you look at kind of the development of cyber operations, there's always been a relationship with the nuclear world. In fact, the, you know, one of the most, one of the primarily known cyber attacks and one of the only one that's created actual physical damage is Stuxnet. And Stuxnet attacked Iranian centrifuges, causing them to spin out of control. Um, but there's also been reports, you know, by David Sanger, for example, about the United States using cyber attacks to slow down or impede the development of ballistic missiles within North Korea. And then in general, we've seen a really large discussion over the last 10 years about the digitization and the modernization of the nuclear command and control systems, which means that this kind of link between the cyber and the nuclear will remain, especially as because these systems become more and more digitized. So here is the question that is motivating our discussion today. How do cyber threats, the nuclear command control and communications, henceforth known as NC3, otherwise this presentation will take us hours, how does that affect decisions to use nuclear weapons in crisis? And in particular, kind of two drop down questions from that. How do perceptions of vulnerability impact decisions to use nuclear weapons? And then what drives those decisions to exploit the NC3 vulnerabilities? In other words, why would people use these NC3 uh, cyber weapons at all? And kind of more practically, because my work is always rooted in kind of implications for today's policy, is what does this mean for cyber and nuclear strategy? All right, so I'm going to give you the findings up front, and then we'll talk about how we got there. So here is the kind of interesting findings. There is a somewhat counterintuitive relationship between these cyber vulnerabilities and exploits in nuclear war. 
So there is little evidence for deliberate escalation because of cyber vulnerabilities. That is a really good news story because I think the general hypothesis is that cyber vulnerabilities will create the kind of anxiety and fear that leads states to take preemptive nuclear attacks. We don't find this. But there seem to be more complicated relationships between uh, cyber and inadvertent or accidental pathways to nuclear use. And in particular, the pathway to inadvertent escalation seems to happen not because of fear and anxiety, but instead overconfidence in cyber capabilities. And the cyber confidence in cyber exploits seems to lead to more decisions for counterforce campaigns. Counterforce campaigns are those that um, target an adversary's nuclear arsenal. And the, this is you know, a slightly escalatory strategy. And the second kind of interesting conclusion is that there seem to be some pathways to accidental use from automation and pre-delegation. So um, like all things cyber, the relationship between cyber and the way humans interact every day is not a simple linear relationship. And that's why wargaming is such a wonderful way to explore these relationships because wargaming is all about human behaviors. All right, so I wanna give a little bit of a brief background on NC3 and nuclear stability writ large. All right, what is this thing that we call NC3? So it's a system of, of sensors, communication capabilities, executive control mechanisms that allow us to see whether there is a strategic threat, to respond to it, and then if necessary, conduct nuclear operations. So this is kind of um, an older unclassified slide that talks about um, what broadly makes up the NC3. And the point is, it's super complicated, but these are basically the technologies that allow us to employ nuclear weapons. Now, the NC3, especially in the United States, has really evolved over time. Now, part of that's due to technology changes, um, you know, especially as we, the, the opening of space and the creation of satellites, um, and now the development of a series of different digital sensors that are all kind of networked together has really changed the way we think about strategic warning for nuclear missiles. So you see a proliferation of sensors. At the same time, the actual use of nuclear weapons has also gotten more complicated because weapons platforms aren't simply bombers. There are also strategic rocket forces, nuclear submarines. You have kind of these different platforms that have different means of communications and different challenges with communications. Um, and in general, communications have also evolved. So we've moved from, from analog or radio to digital capabilities and over the horizon communications via satellite. So all of these technology changes change the structure of NC3. But at the same time, doctrine has also changed. So before the Soviet Union developed nuclear weapons, the United States didn't really have to worry about second strike, which meant your sole concern when building the NC3 was using these things, not surviving a first strike and then responding. So that led to a very uncomplicated NC3. But as the Soviets developed nuclear weapons, so also did the US doctrine have to evolve. And so then you saw uh, kind of debates about either massive retaliation, where we're just going to launch everything in response to a first strike, um, and then flexible response. And flexible response required a controlled escalation. I know this is a bit of an anathema um, to us who are kind of <laughs> um, millennials, um, but you know, there's a lot of discussion during the Cold War about the ability to have kind of small nuclear war. Um, and if you're going to have small nuclear war, you need a very complicated NC3 because you need to be able to control your measures of escalation, um, especially in the face of, uh, of nuclear, nuclear attacks themselves. And then finally, in the post 9-11 world, you see a bunch of entanglement between conventional systems and nuclear systems um, as there became a, a bit of a, a shift in strategic thought about what is strategic. And so in the United States, you know, you see this transition to more of a discussion about global strike, a lot more um, dual use platforms. Um, and so with that NC3, some of the characteristics of NC3 changes as well. And I think this is a really lovely um, way to show this. Um, this kind of evolution of NC3. And um, I think this is a, a book from Desmond Ball. Um, and so you see kind of the centralized control, centralized command system when you don't have to worry about second strike, then you start worrying about second strike and you move to this more decentralized command system. Um, but this has problems in and of itself because you also have nodes that can decompose very quickly. And this leads to a distributed communication system, which is highly complex. 
Um, and so what's interesting, this distributed communication system is kind of where we are now. There was a, a great quote by Hyten, who was speaking at um, a Stanford event a few years ago, who said, um, I don't know how my NC3 works, but I know it works. And that's because the system itself has become so complicated um, that there's a lot of kind of trust that the system works, but being able to track the digital information from, from send to receive is a little bit difficult. Okay, so why do we even care about NC3? Well, we have theories about how NC3 affects nuclear stability. And I would say the dominant theory here is one of asymmetric vulnerability. And this is um, a theory which creates incentives for deliberate escalation. So Ashton Carter, I think, is kind of the best reference here. He did some work in managing nuclear operations where he argues that faced with alarming analyses, superpower command systems can come to fear their vulnerability so much that they take seriously the need to strike first. So this is the belief that vulnerabilities in NC3 create incentives for deliberate escalation um, or kind of first nuclear strike. There's a slightly more complicated um, uh, assertion from Desmond Ball, who looks at kind of the control of nuclear forces and the role that that leads to for inadvertent escalation and accidents. So he says, particular restraint must be exercised with respect to the command and control capabilities of each participant in order to ensure that each maintains continued control over its strategic forces. So, this is the idea that these vulnerabilities, they may not lead to deliberate escalation, but they increase the chances that someone accidentally uses nuclear weapons or, or uses the wrong amount of nuclear weapons. And then finally, there are two other kind of theories, and one is that there's a mutual vulnerability. So if both states believe that their NC3 is vulnerable, this will lead to deterrence. And then finally, I think this is definitely um, a thought that's in the minority, is kind of an asymmetric dominance which is that if you have the ability to cut off your adversary's NC3, um, then that allows you to escalate to dominate. And I would say that at least in American writings about NC3 and nuclear stability, that fourth hypothesis about asymmetric dominance is the least likely one for us to see in that, um, in that writing. Now, most of this writing that I'm just referencing is coming from the 80s and the 90s. So we're talking like the very, very early infancy of computers and digital technologies. And it's really, I mean, it's thinking a little bit about the threat of cyber, but cyber as a word is not even a thing. So that brings us today. What do we know from our exploration of cyber about how cyber affects nuclear stability? Well, I want to start more broadly with the literature on escalation and cyber. So I, I, I kind of put these in three bins. So cyber as an escalating force. And I think this actually was the dominant hypothesis of most of the foundational literature about cyberspace and escalation, um, whether it's Lubicki and some of Herb uh, Lin's work. And then I think Ben Buchanan's 2016 book is a really good example of this belief that cyber is inherently offensive, that it's highly uncertain, and that it therefore creates incentives for escalation. Um, I have some work that suggests that kind of the structure of the, the network in some instances can also create this incentive for deliberate escalation. I call it the capability vulnerability paradox. Um, but in, um, there's also a bunch of work, and this is where things are kind of going now, that says that cyber is either de-escalating or has limited impact. So, you know, Valeriano has an argument that, this, that cyber operations actually expand the bargaining space. If you look at Joe Nye's work or John Lindsay, they have some arguments about entanglement and how entanglement creates incentives for restraint. And then there's a series of work that is both theoretical and empirical that says, look, cyber operations just don't seem to matter. They have limited emotional or physical effects. Um, they're very, they're actually far more difficult to be offensive than we've seen in the past. And I would say that this is actually the dominant literature that's come out in the last two to three years. So all this is experimental work, big data work. Um, Borgard and Lonigan is kind of more theoretical. So, you know, this, I would say the primary consensus in contemporary cyber and escalation literature is that cyber operations have little impact on escalation and in some cases can actually provide a de-escalation incentive. Now that is not the consensus in the cyber and nuclear literature. Most of that literature argues that cyber will destabilize nuclear crises. And this is for a few reasons. One is this kind of deliberate 
pathway to escalation. This is what we talked about with Ashton Carter in his 1987 piece. Um, Lindsay and Gardsky in their 2017 thermonuclear war piece talk about overconfidence and how that creates a cyber commitment problem. And then, you know, there's some great work from Acton in 2009 that's talking about entanglement and how that could create incentives for inadvertent escalation. And then kind of um, early Symbala in 1989 talking about how automation and pre-delegation lead to accidents. So not a good news story from the cyber and thermonuclear war literature. So this leads us to three hypotheses. The first is our escalatory hypothesis, and this is kind of the windows of vulnerability. So when individuals believe they're asymmetrically more vulnerable, they'll be more likely to use nuclear weapons preemptively. In our stabling hypotheses, we have two somewhat related hypotheses. One is the mutual vulnerability, that when states or individuals believe they have similar NC3 vulnerabilities, they'll restrain their nuclear use. And the second, um, this expanded bargaining space, this is related to some of the Valeriano work, and that's when individuals have an exploit, exploit that gives them the space that they don't feel like they have to use nuclear weapons. And then finally, kind of the null hypothesis, hey, cyberspace operations will have limited effect on nuclear use. All right, now this, I talk about this with other audiences. I feel like I have less of a sell to do here, but why war games? Uh, why not just um, interviews or surveys? Well, war games provide us an opportunity to look at situations that are very, very rare. I mean, thank goodness, we don't have a lot of nuclear cases to explore. So when we have an emerging technology that's affecting a technology that we don't use very often, there's very little, way, little ways to test the hypotheses. And that's why I think the vast majority of the literature in cyberspace, especially cyber and nuclear, asserts hypotheses but has trouble with falsification of those hypotheses, whether proving or disproving. And so war games provide us an opportunity to look at these, these rare circumstances. And if we believe that it's human behaviors that affect these rare circumstances, then war games are a particularly useful application. So I think um, a few of you may have seen a piece that I am working on with Eric Lynn Greenberg and Reed Polly that looks at kind of the introduction of war games within the academic discipline. Um, but we define a war game as, um, as war games immerse human players, so it's all about the human, in interactive scenarios. So there's something that they are engaging with where they make decisions in accordance with given rules and react to the consequences of their choice. Um, and so the consequence element is what kind of makes um, the immersion and creates the external validity that we might not have in a survey experiment. So I don't, I don't feel like I have to sell this much here, but, but why wargaming is a research method. I've talked a little bit about empirical precedent, behavioral hypotheses, but also there are really great methodology when the, you primarily believe that decisions are being made in groups. Um, they can also be useful as brainstorming, though you'll see that this, um, this war game is a very um, deductive design. It's not inductive at all. Um, and then there's a general, I believe these are more externally valid than lab or survey experiments. Um, I think the field in general has had trouble in the past proving this, but maybe it's just because we haven't tried to measure it very well. All right, so with no further ado, the game. Okay, so we um, use an explicitly experimental design in our game setup. So players are randomly assigned to one of four games. They're, the only difference between the games is whether they have an NC3 vulnerability or an NC3 access exploit. So in the full treatment group, they have both the vulnerability and the exploit. In the control group, they have neither. There are two asymmetric groups. So one asymmetric group has the exploit, but no vulnerability. And the other asymmetric group has the vulnerability, but no exploit. Now there are two scenarios. Um, one is kind of lower intensity. Um, we actually thought it was high intensity, but turns out you can't get people to nuclear war very easily. So after we ran the game at two different uh, places, we said, oh shoot, if this is a game about nuclear, we need to develop a second scenario that's more intense. And so there are two scenarios that are um, related, but not based on the actions that people take. So it's one move and um, they do a crisis response plan and single-sided. So that allowed us to not um, have adjudicators. Now, 
for the war gamers in the room. Why did we say one move single sided? Doesn't that get away from the consequences of the actions in the game? Won't that lead players to take uh, reckless moves, for example, in their first move because they don't consider having a second? Maybe, I mean, we don't really see that in the game, um, but you'll notice that we made decisions about game design that prioritized our ability to play the game many, 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 many times. So going into this game, we knew that there was very little examples of games that have been iterated consistently and with control over many, many iterations. And we decided that we wanted to demonstrate that this could be done. And it, where we had to make the choice between internal validity or the ability to control for causal mechanisms um, and um, complexity or external validity, we would go for internal validity. So we've made decisions about abstraction, about ease of design, that um, really we're trying to create a simple game that asks a very simple, small question. Um, and we can talk more about those decisions um, in the Q&A. Okay, so game design. Um, in the recorded data, we have about 581 players. I think we've actually played it now with probably 650, but we stopped data collection after a certain point. 71% um, American, 29% non-American. Um, skews male, um, that's unfortunate, but that is the type of people that opt into our game. Um, in general, our group skews a little bit older. So most of our players are between 30 and 50, and we have a, about 28% over 50, and then a small group that's under 30. This is because after we had collected a bunch of kind of experts, um, we decided let's make this pool more heterogeneous and see whether there's a difference between these high expertise games and students, for example. So we played, the played in um, 12 locations over two and a half years, multiple iterations at the Naval War College, um, one, the first one was in Thailand on the back of a track to negotiation between India and Pakistan. Um, we played at Harvard, that was with um, consulate members in Boston. Uh, Norway and Argentina were both Naval War College international alumni groups. So these are kind of naval officers that are in either the NATO countries or South America. Sandia National Labs, that was in partnership with CSIS the Naval Postgraduate School, um, Stanford, which was a highly cyber and Silicon Valley tech pool, and then um, with students at Georgetown, Tufts, and then MIT was actually the business school. So that group was um, actually had a previous sect up in it. So uh, kind of students, but kind of actually not, actually high experts. Um, and then we played um, the last game in April of 2020. So that was a virtual game. Uh, it was a really interesting game. We can talk more about kind of the role of the medium and the transition to virtual um, in uh, the question and answer. So our population. So in terms of kind of how people identify their expertise, we have people who identify themselves as a high expert in cyber, about 15%, high expert in nuclear, about 16%. Majority of our group had military experience, um, but we also had a bunch of individuals that have private sector experience and government experience. Um, people identify themselves as either mid or senior level experts, about 82% of our population. All right, here's our scenario. Um, so you'll notice, this is, notice it is highly abstract. The idea was for people to stay at the very strategic level. And then we also really wanted people to, um, to not think about one particular place or location. We knew we were gonna play with acting government members and we didn't want them to feel like they couldn't reveal their true preferences because it revealed a true classified relationship or um, doctrine. So the general scenario, our state, other state, um, other state, uh, our state includes gray region, which is a semi-autonomous region. Um, other state has kind of ethnic relationships with the gray region and they roll into the gray region and start taking it over. And that's what starts scenario one. Now by scenario two, other state has rolled into our state, has taken some of our state territory and has put its nuclear forces at alert. So we are right at the edge of war, uh, edge of nuclear war by scenario two. Here is the treatment. This is the exploit treatment. So this is us telling them what their exploit is. You'll notice we made decisions about whether to use, for example, a percentage of a probability of success. We decided not to. We can talk more about that, but there's actual academic literature about how people fixate on numbers. So we decided 
let's just tell them there's a high probability of success, but we need to hedge it and say that it's effective for an undetermined amount of time, relatively covert, but attribution may be possible. And we think this represents some of the uncertainties that are inherent in the use of cyber operations. So that's the exploit. Here's the vulnerability. You'll notice the vulnerability is a mirror image of the language. So where we hedged about um, uncertainties with exploits, we also hedged for vulnerabilities. So these are as mirror imaged as possible. Here is your treatment saying you don't have access and your treatment saying you don't have a vulnerability. So uh, we made sure that our treatments actually treated um, even for the situations where they did not have the exploit or the vulnerability. All right, data collection. This is always a fun, uh, difficult thing for war games. Uh, we have a few ways of doing data collection. The first, and this, this is the primary method of data collection on the dependent variable. So our dependent variable, if our independent variable is cyber exploit or cyber vulnerability, our dependent variable is nuclear use. Um, and we categorize that or operationalize that as nuclear use, but also nuclear alert. So that we measure with a response plan, and the end there is the game, not the number of players. Um, there are five players to each game, so our n for our dependent variable is, you know, a fifth the size as the n for our surveys. Um, so the response plan measured actions and outcomes. It provided both um, quantitative data about what they chose to do and qualitative data about plans and strategy. The surveys, the N is the player, and that captured individual behaviors and motivations for action. So it explored variables that were not explicitly in the scenario, for example, asymmetric capabilities, and then it identified within group differences. So the group may choose one thing, but did the individuals have different beliefs? And then we also kind of use facilitator and plenary notes. Most of those we ended up throwing out, but if used correctly, um, it, they can help highlight group dynamics that is really difficult to capture in the survey. Um, and then what is interesting is when we transferred over to the virtual game, we were able to use also virtual um, survey tools, digital survey tools. Um, and so our facilitators were able to take quizzes at the end of their um, facilitation about kind of group dynamics and allowed us a quantitative measure of group dynamics that we actually didn't have in the in-person games because um, we hadn't, we don't have, we don't have tablets. We just give people pieces of paper. So we didn't have surveys um, for facilitators and also talk more about this, but the in-person game often doesn't have a facilitator for each group. Sometimes we run it in a big room. And so you have like two or three facilitators for the whole room that are kind of um, waiting around for questions. All right, here's the response plan. This is the major data collection device for the dependent variable. So you'll see there's a qualitative at the top. Describe your overall response plan course of action. The select response actions allows us to have a quantitative measurement of that overall response plan, um, which is really helpful for doing just basic statistical work. And then describe your response, response plan's desired end state. And then finally, um, another kind of quantitative attempt to try and um, measure objectives of the response plan. All right, so the good stuff, the findings. All right, so here is our propensity to use memes in games. In general, scenario one, um, we are seeing much more focus on kind of what you would think of as gray zone operations. So diplomacy, sanctions, um, intel collection, some level of cyber attack. Scenario two, things are actually kind of much more ratcheted up. So when you go and look at the actual kind of um, discussion that people had in the response plans, scenario one, you're looking at primarily hedging strategies. A lot of discussion about returning to status quo, de-escalating tension, garnering international support. Kind of interestingly, a lot of focus on information narratives. I think this is a phenomenon that is relatively recent. Um, this is a good example of one of those discussions about information narratives. Create leverage over other state by having a stronger narrative. Other state intentionally escalated the situation in gray region through organizing a riot. We set up a campaign of diplomatic pressure, isolate and drain them economically. Militarily, we're merely posturing defensively along the border, not yet heading back. Kind of interesting because literally other state is in, their ter in this gray region, which is their territory, but in general, Scenario one, people are hedging. 
By scenario two, there's a transition to more active measures, including attacks. So in general, the teams preferred maritime and air attacks over ground campaigns. Um, and we see an increase in cyber attacks versus military and civilian infrastructure. We also see counterforce campaigns. So campaigns that are designed explicitly to take out other states' nuclear arsenal. There is in general a focus on avoiding nuclear war. So it's a good quote, defend and take back the homeland while reducing losses to civilian lives and military personnel without nuclear impact. Kind of interesting, we don't see a lot of variance um, about like few teams surrender to the gray region but also a few teams use the crisis as an opportunity to take new territory. So the mean, the median is to think of this kind of as a let's return to status quo. But what about the dependent variable? Um, so here is uh, the propensity to use cyber and nuclear operations in scenario one. And the good news story here is there's no nuclear attack in scenario one, yay! Um, but it's a little more complicated when we get to nuclear alert and cyber attack on NC3. So you'll see there that the teams that were more likely to go to nuclear alert, um, and this is actually statistically significant, were the teams that had the exploit, not the vulnerability. And I, when this, these results started coming in, I called my team members, Rachel and Ben, and I said, Rachel, Ben, you guys got to go back to the packets and make sure we put the right treatments in because this, this doesn't make sense. Why are more teams going to nuclear alert that have the exploit than the vulnerability? And they, they checked and they looked like, no, 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 <laughs> we've been doing this right. And actually we saw this consistently over all the games. There wasn't a significant difference between the games. Um, I'll explain kind of why we think this might have happened a little bit later. The other thing that we see here is that the teams that have the exploit and no vulnerability, the asymmetric exploit teams, were actually almost half of those teams used their exploit even in the first scenario. Um, which is interesting because you would think maybe they were reserving for later use, but we see a lot of use in the first scenario. Um, and then the teams that had the exploit and the vulnerability, you'll see that they use the exploit, about 25% of those teams use the exploit, but it's a much smaller amount. And this is also a statistically significant difference um, between the asymmetric exploit team. So having both the exploit and the vulnerability does lead to some restraint in cyberspace. Moving on to scenario two, we still see very, very little nuclear attack. I think that's great. Um, in general, kind of as a, a value statement, I'm, I'm all for uh, non-use of nuclear weapons. Um, but the teams that did use nuclear weapons, once again, it's not about the vulnerability, it's about the exploit. So, you know, that team, you know, the, the group, the 20% group that used nuclear attack, that's the asymmetric exploit team not the asymmetric vulnerability team. You'll also see most of our teams went to nuclear alert. Now here's the interesting thing. Look at that last bar graph there, cyber attack, nuclear command and control. Say, oh, you know, this is really popular. But look, like 95% of the teams that had the um, exploit and the you know, vulnerability use the exploit. And in the teams that had the asymmetric exploit also used the exploit, wow. How can teams that didn't have the exploit use an exploit? I mean, I have 35% of the no exploit vulnerability teams used an exploit. Well, what happened there is the teams that were told they had no exploit wrote in an exploit, um, which was fascinating to us because they were told they didn't have it and it was so important to them that they actually wrote it into their plans. And I'll talk more about that down here. Okay. So what's the impact of the NC3 vulnerabilities? Going into this, I think the null hypothesis is that the vulnerabilities are the primary kind of mechanism that creates instability. Well, here's a bit of a good news story. We have no evidence within the game series that cyber vulnerabilities led to preemptive nuclear use. Um, in the mutual vulnerability groups, um, they did reference restraint incentives. So there is some evidence that the cyber vulnerabilities actually create um, some level of restraint, whether it's cyber restraint or nuclear restraint. Good quote here, avoid nuclear wars if possible as they have access to IC3 but can't access theirs. And so we see kind of in instances or references to restraint, 60% in that first scenario, 
and then slightly less 48% in the second scenario. Now, what is a little more concerning is that when I started diving through the actual qualitative material um, and looking at their description of their response plans, there was some evidence that the vulnerabilities led to automation and pre-delegation. So here's some three really good examples. So one said, emphasize dead hand orders to our strategic nuclear forces. So these are teams that have the vulnerability. Emphasize preemption, protect our NC3 by disabling to bring to an autonomous level. Um, and then finally, separate part of our nuclear deterrence from our NC3 system by delegating authority to lower level commanders to mount a nuclear retaliation. So um, we were not explicitly using uh, automation or pre-delegation as a dependent variable. Um, but interesting that this came up in so many of the crisis response plans. Now here's the more interesting story is the exploits. So what was the impact of the NC3 exploits? Well, first off, boy, people wanted to use those exploits as signals. And we can talk in Q&A, but I hate cyber as a signal. But people loved it. They wanted to use cyber exploits as a signal. So good example here, we're going with cyber attacks on nuclear C3, try to keep undercover. Our goal is to show we can defend ourselves. So we had a lot of discussions about that. And actually we um, asked in surveys about kind of why they use the exploit and signaling is one of the primary things that they said. But exploits always seem, also seem to be a counterforce weapon of choice. So um, they talk a lot about using the NC3 exploit to uh, take out the nuclear capabilities of the other state. So cyber attack on nuclear C3 and come out to them. Employ NC3 cyber attack, use conventional attacks to destroy other countries' nuclear weapons. Cyber attack on NC3 combined with airstrike on the nuclear capability. So you often saw that the cyber attack and the exploit was paired with more aggressive counterforce strategy. So belief in the exploit led states to be confident enough to use uh, force in other, other domains to take out nuclear weapons. And then I think this actually is the explanation for why we saw more nuclear alert from the exploits. It's not that states felt more vulnerable because they had the exploit. It's that they knew they were taking a more aggressive strategy um, because they had the exploit. And so they wanted to alert their nuclear forces. So if you know you're going to conduct a counterforce campaign, you're also going to put your forces on nuclear alert because you know that um, you know that it, the, the bad stuff is coming back at you. So here's an example. You know, somebody said alert nuclear forces to reduce vulnerability to preemption, um, trigger exploit to pressure them. So they were realizing that what they were doing could create some sort of escalatory spiral. Um, and so they put their forces on nuclear alert. So we think this is the relationship between the exploit and the uh, nuclear uh, alert. Okay, so I've already told this, but the exploits were extremely popular. So for those of you policymakers who really think that uh, that nuclear taboo is going to transfer over nicely to cyber uh, attacks against NC3, that does not seem to be the case. <laughs> People use the exploits, especially in the second scenario. Um, these are examples of teams that did not have the exploit, but actually wrote it into their plans. So one group that had no exploit but the vulner and no vulnerability said, we'll deter nuclear attack by cyber attack on nuclear C3. Another, which is in the asymmetric vulnerability group, said, we'll cut off NC3 and publicly announce that every nuclear site um, uh, have a, 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 a autonomic, uh, misspelling is not mine, um, authority to launch a retaliation strike. So very interesting that these were perceived as um, such interesting and useful tools that states that didn't have them, or groups that didn't have them actually wrote them in. So why were the exploits so popular? I have a few theories. Um, first, and this is a game design issue, which we're going to have to test in other games, but maybe we just created such a balanced and symmetrical um, game design that that presenting the cyber exploit was like putting your finger on an otherwise completely balanced scale. Um, we did create a very luring exploit. And those of you who are on this call who are cyber experts know that a cyber exploit that takes out control of all nuclear weapons is not highly likely. That is a somewhat um, 
incredulous uh, cyber exploit. But we knew from the previous research that people are in general very reticent to use cyber operations. So we chose intentionally to bias in the opposite direction because the vast majority of the empirical work go leading up to this suggested that it was really, really hard to get cyber to matter at all. So we developed a treatment that was a bit of a bludgeon. Now, the next game series, we're going to, to change these cyber um, exploit a bit and see if kind of a, a more balanced, um, less uh, incredulous cyber exploit would create the same kind of incentives. Um, the other reason I think exploits were so popular is that I see a cognitive bias, and I actually see this cognitive bias in my other work as well, is that there seems to be an overconfidence in the cyber capabilities, but at the same time, players tend to downplay vulnerabilities. So we told the players who had the vulnerabilities that they didn't know where it was and they couldn't just patch to fix it. But oh my goodness, so many of the crisis response plans said, well, we'll just patch it. I mean, it was shocking to me. And we heard this over and over again. So players, um, and I think this is actually, I, I would say this is an externally valid finding because this is something I hear in kind of day-to-day -day conversation um, and that we know too. And um, when I know there's a vulnerability with my um, you know, Windows system, I mean, how much urge do I feel to patch it, right? Like there, we don't always make completely rational decisions in cyberspace. And then I think in general, another reason why exploits were so popular was that there was a belief that cyber operations were less escalatory and covert. So this kind of goes back to the Valeriano idea that, that states believe that these are kind of an option that they can have below the use of force that may allow them to diffuse the situation without having to resort to the use of force. Why didn't some teams use the exploit? Um, well, the teams that didn't use the exploit, the primary reason seemed to be that they were concerned about adversary nuclear retaliation, or in the first scenario, res were reserving for, uh, for later use. So some concluding thoughts. First, good news story. Little evidence for deliberate escalation in these games due to NC3 vulnerabilities. And there is some evidence that NC3 exploits actually, um, or the vulnerabilities actually increase the stability. Um, and the players often dismiss the vulnerability. So when we worry about why cyber might create instability, I think we focus too much on the vulnerabilities and don't focus enough on how the cyber capabilities create kind of an overconfidence. The kind of less good news stories is that cyber vulnerab vulnerabilities while they don't create incentives for deliberate escalation, they may increase the chance of accident or nuclear or inadvertent escalation. And I, I want to highlight how dangerous that pre-delegation of authority um, and nuclear alert and automation can be for nuclear stability dynamics. And then finally, and I think this is maybe the most interesting finding from this game series, is that the cyber exploits seem to incentivize counterforce campaigns. So it is fascinating, this is something that comes up in some of the John Lindsay stuff, that maybe the overconfidence in cyber may incentivize strikes in other domains. And I think that's something that needs to be explored and seen uh, to see whether it stands up in different games or in different situations. Now, where do we go from here? And um, this has been a long project. And um, we have a series of, uh, series of papers that are coming out. This is the main paper that we just presented here. But we also have uh, work that we're working on that looks at kind of the virtual, that compares the virtual games to the in-person games, and then also compares those to survey experiments to see whether there's a, a difference in outcomes or a difference in deliberative behaviors. The other thing we're really fascinated in, which I don't think we did a good job of collecting on, is the role of the group. It was a really strong intermediary variable in our um, analysis. And it's actually difficult to know kind of how group dynamics worked in the game. The role of the medium in measuring immersion. And I think in general, we need to figure out better ways of measuring how immersed our players are, and whether that immersion leads to um, decision making that looks like the real world or decision making that looks like really good game playing. And we all know that those are slightly different. Um, the other interesting paper that we're working on is the mediating role of expertise. So we're starting to disaggregate how um, different cultural affiliations, different types of exper expertise, cyber or nuclear, um, different age groups, you know, our students versus our, our high expertise, um, whether expertise has a role in these outcomes. And then this is the exciting thing, we're looking for new samples. So next year, um, Thankful to the funding of the Stanton Foundation and uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, we will be taking these work 
Games to Asia. So that is a really, really exciting um, move for us for the next War Games series. Kind of substantively, um, on cyber operations and war, we're interested in this next kind of game series to look at how cyber attacks against ISR or sensors and situational awareness um, or weapons platforms affect nuclear stability. We looked solely at control here. That's actually not a very likely vulnerability, but these other vulnerabilities are pretty common and likely. So we want to look at those. We also, we keep coming back to this idea of role of network structure and um, perceptions of network vulnerability and the application of percolation theory, which has to do with kind of network resilience and degradation um, and looking at how kind of human perceptions of that can affect decisions to use nuclear uh, cyber uh, weapons. And then in general, and we can talk more about this in Q and A, we created a scenario where the balance of power was strictly equal, but in the survey, we asked if we changed that balance of power, how would it affect their uses of all these different types of means that we give them in the game? Um, and the resounding uh, finding was that um, whether we created asymmetry where we had more power or they had more power, all, most of our survey respondents said that they think they would have used cyber more. So cyber definitely seems to be a tool of asymmetry. And that's something that we want to look at more. So I am eager and excited to, to get your questions. Thanks so much for listening to our research. Thank you very much, Jackie. And I'll, I'll kick, the, kick off the, the Q&A with, with the question about the external validity of your findings. Uh, you've been a member of the Solarium Commission. You've done some very important policy work. Um, and in, in, your, um, in your publications, you've talked about war games having greater external validity than alternative scholarly methods. Yeah, you know, this is one of those things where my hunch is that our, uh, is that games are more externally valid. What I mean by that is when you think about kind of the validity of, of a research, there is both the internal and the external. The internal is have we built do we, can we understand the causal relationships, right? So this is like, have we inserted substantive bias? Um, is there a way to control for things so that we can clearly say that X affects Y? I think academic work privileges internal validity in general, but sometimes you could develop a really great internally valid design, uh, whether that's a survey or a war game, but it doesn't represent the way you would make a decision in real life. And I think I go back to surveys quite often as the antithesis or the, um, the comparison with war games. So there's a great deal of work now that's being done using survey and survey experiments to try and understand or even predict what kind of foreign policy decision making will be. But I, I don't know if anybody watching this has taken surveys. I generally write my best answer in the survey. Um, so I don't use a lot of my cognitive biases here. I'm, I just, this is my best answer. And I think that games, because of the complexity of lots of different information and interacting with others, and hopefully this idea that you've bought into the game, that players are more likely to take cognitive shortcuts and rely on heuristics that look more like what we would do in real life. But we've had trouble proving this. Um, I know Reed Polly is starting to work on kind of how some how he can trace some some games to policy outcomes. Um, but I think this has been a general um, question mark within this field is we all have a sense that these games are worthwhile because they seem to be more externally valid, but we have not found a way to prove that empirically. Thank you. And we have a couple of questions related to the the outcomes of the games and going back to your original definition of what is a game and being able to live with with that consequence um, so two questions are um, did the players know that this was a one game move and with the assumption that doing this completely changes their 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 mindset and the other question is you know do you think that the ability to visualize the specific effects um, of cyber leads to le led to some of your findings. Yeah. Okay. So in the first one about um, are they are they making different decisions because it's just one move? I was really concerned about that. Um, I think if you look at scenario one and the amount of hedging that's happening there, 
that would suggest that people think they're are, are kind of mentally prepping for multiple moves, right? So if we saw a bunch in first in the first move take make a nuclear attack, I would say, oh, <laughs> they're not invested. They don't think there are, are subsequent moves. So I I do think that people were were going there mentally to think about how their actions in that first scenario and then the second scenario would transcend and actually if you go through the response plans you have a bunch of if then statements which i think is symptomatic of of people who are invested in the hypothetical next moves of the game even though there are no next moves um because i saw so many of those if thens in the response plans i'm less worried that that having a single move created um responses that would not have occurred in multi-move games um now, we're, that's something that we're going to try in the next game series. But in this game series, the, we, we thought we lost so much statistical power um, and de attenuated our sample so much by including multiple moves. And we also, oh my gosh, I'll be honest, because we were doing this so many times, and this is the first time somebody, one of the first times people have done this, we didn't want to include complicated adjudication. Um, so that was kind of our decisions there. Um, I think I forgot the second part of that question. Uh, the second, the second part of the question is: Do you do you think the inability to visualize the specific effects of cyber leads to? Um, yeah, to yeah. Well, I mean, that's actually a reality of life, right? So, I mean, how much money is the U.S. invested in trying to create some sort of um, visual or even statistical uh, measurement of? cyber effects. So I actually think the, the way we were presented, the, the cyber effects is very common with how uh, a cyber effect would be presented in, in a real life briefing. So I, I, think that's, I think that's relatively valid. Now, something I'm working on in this next game series is I'm really interested in how perceptions of the network um, and when presented with more granular information about the network affected, would, it would affect these decisions to use cyber vulnerabilities. Because I think that would inform people about what they believe the effectiveness of that um, attack would be. So I'm gonna be running a series of experiments over the next year that look specifically at the interaction of perceptions with graphic depictions of um, different types of networks. So they vary kind of how many nodes they have, how big the nodes are, how many bridges there are between nodes. And we have another question um, that gets at the, the distinction between outcomes and mechanisms in, in political science. And this is, this is from a professional wargaming perspective, but um, the, the, the questions are, you, know, you seem to have recorded what players did, uh, but how did you capture what they believed? Yeah, I think, I think that's a general um, challenge with war games, especially if you're not able to um, either take complete notes um, about what everyone's saying or complete recordings. And I actually hope we can integrate technology more in the future to get complete recordings of what people say. What we use to try and get to that um, deliberative, I think Reed and Eric and I think about this as outcome data versus deliberative data. And so that deliberative data, I use, I rely very much on surveys. Um, and the qualitative part of the crisis response plan. So when developing the survey, I create kind of hypotheses about the ways in which my independent variable is going to affect my dependent variable. And then I generate survey questions to try and get at that individual mechanism about how my independent variable affects my dependent variable. Um, and then, so we use that but then I have to say it was really, really, really helpful to then go back into the crisis response plans and examine the qualitative data as well. Um, and that was a bit of a treasure trove, I think, in, in trying to understand, okay, I have this great data about individual motivations that comes from the survey, but what does that mean for the group? And so the qualitative data from the crisis response plan was helpful in that sense. And so the, the follow-up question to that was why did you discard the facilitator notes that captured some of those beliefs? Um, because we weren't consistent um, at first with the facilitator notes. And so some of our facilitators, there was a wide variance in the facilitator notes. The second thing, the second um, problem was only a few of the game series were we able to have facilitators at each and every one of the different groups. Um, that was a really heavy lift for us. And so 
what we started learning was that the easier way to get large numbers of people was to put lots and lots of people at kind of big circular tables in giant event spaces. So like the Stanford one, we held in an event hall that, holded, that held like 350 people and we had about 100 there. <laughs> Right at the beginning of coronavirus. Um, and so what that meant is we had three to four facilitators that roamed the room um, or that pre and presented the scenario. And so if there's three to four facilitators, we can't take notes on the actual group dynamics there. So that was um, a shame. Now, once we went to virtual, virtual requires facilitators in order to make sure that the technology works. And so when we moved to virtual, then we were able to get facilitator notes in a much more consistent way. And also because it was online, we were able to use Qualtrics. And so I was able to use kind of the same um, online survey methods that I would use for other populations. And that was really helpful. Now, I will say we tried to get the, the players themselves to comment on their group dynamics within the surveys. So we had a question in the survey that said, describe the group, your group dynamics. And we had kind of these um, different cat categories, right? Like it was hierarchical, it was collaborative, it was one player was dominant, you know, these different kind of categorizations. And it ended up being a useless question because everyone said they were collaborative, which is, um, it's BS. I mean, they weren't all collaborative, but it was interesting how sometimes people, um, when given surveys, um, don't answer honestly. And we have we have another question regarding the correlation between what you saw as, as player actions and historical data. Um, you did mention that there's there's some historical case studies, but are you seeing what happened in, in the gaming environment is, is similar or different from other situations like Korea and, and Ukraine and, and Crimea? Um, I mean, those are different, you know, we've got different situations there. Um, so what I think is different in our game series than what kind of we've seen empirically in the past was, I think, especially in the Obama administration, there was a real reticence to use cyber operations. And we expected we would continue to see that in this game series. That we did not see. <laughs> and then maybe that reflects kind of the big change in the United States to a more offensive uh, or at least assertive, preemptive persistent and um, cyber posture, but we saw a lot more cyber use in these games, even cyber use about, um, you know, cyber attacks against critical infrastructure or cyber attacks against military targets. We saw a lot more of that in these games than we have seen in previous research. And so that was a bit of a surprise to us. I actually, I kind of think that that represents reality and it represents kind of when you're doing a game for two and a half years and as things are changing politically, that, that, that does change as well. And we have, a, we have a question on the effect of participants' understanding of both nuclear and cyber on, on the decisions that you saw in, in the game and how might pre-existing understanding or, or misunderstanding of, of that influence how players use cyber weapons in, in your games. Yeah, absolutely. We really thought expertise was going to be a big, um, a big deal here. And I want to highlight, actually, we do have some evidence about why wargaming is better than survey experiments on this issue. So in the virtual game, I included questions in the survey about comprehension, comprehension about the nuclear, about the treatments, about the, you know, the exploits, the vulnerabilities, comprehension questions also about the, the baseline scenario. And then I run a very similar survey experiment that gives them the exact same amount of materials and then ask them the same comprehension questions. And there is a very, very strong difference in comprehension about both the treatments and the scenario between war games and survey experiments. Um, I saw in some cases a 40% drop in comprehension about the treatment in the survey experiment. So that's Great <laughs> for wargaming, right? It shows that people are internalizing wargaming. It also, you know, when you're when you're presenting this information and you're people are allowed to ask questions, which is helpful because you give them they, you know, if, if they don't understand the treatment, they can speak about it with you. Um, but kind of more granularly, we started, we've been starting to disaggregate expertise to look at kind of how expertise, whether it's cyber expertise or nuclear expertise, changes decisions in the game. Some of that research is still ongoing, so I don't want to um, skew too much, but here's what we've found so far. So there's a really, really good comparison that you can make between um, our group that we played in Norway, which was primarily um, senior Navy officers um, that were from NATO countries um, or European countries that had, had been at the Naval War College at some point. 
And then we also had a similar group that was in South America. And so the South American group, um, also Naval War College alumni, mostly naval, senior naval officers, but not from NATO, right? So South America does not have a history of nuclear weapons. Europe has a history of thinking about nuclear weapons. And we, if you look at the difference in the, um, the campaign plans for the South American games versus the Norway games, you see that the, the South American games are much, much more likely to take counterforce campaigns. And I think that actually does represent a difference in kind of expertise about nuclear stability. I think that um, when you are early thinking about nuclear weapons and nuclear stability, counterforce campaigns seem to be very charming. <laughs> um, and the more you think about these issues, the more complicated it becomes about like how stable or how useful counterforce campaigns really are. So I do think that that level, that expertise may have affected some of the counterforce decisions. Now, in general, like when we looked at our student populations versus our high expert populations, uh, not seeing a huge, huge difference in the kind of dependent variable. And I think that's partly because when in groups, we tend towards the average or the mean. And so when you are measuring a group decision versus an individual decision, expertise becomes a law of averages. Um, and I think that, that that may have actually made expertise less important in this particular game. But that's something we're still working on. Um, I did pull out some of the cyber expertise. I thought our cyber experts would, would function very differently, actually, than our other, our other um, players. And so the games that had high cyber expertise, they pulled those out and looked at those. And you actually don't see very different cyber play at all from those groups, which was a little bit surprising to me. Um, but that is, that is research that's ongoing. And we have a, a question here that, that chimes in very well with, the, with your discussion on how different, um, different participants and looked at the game, played the game differently. And you know, could you talk a little bit more about uh, how you carried out the game in Thailand and, and who was involved as part of that? Yeah, Thailand was a really extraordinary opportunity. I want to thank um, Andrew Winner, my former boss at the Naval War College, for giving us that opportunity. Um, so that game was at the back of a track two negotiation. So it was very senior members of the national security community from India and Pakistan. And we mixed the team, so it wasn't just India versus Pakistan. Um, and uh, that, you know, when you look at the survey, in the survey, we asked questions about what, um, does this scenario remind you of a real world scenario? Uh, if so, what? <laughs> that one you can imagine most people thought Kashmir. And um, in general, that's not what everyone thought. And Americans in general, I think, had problems understanding why this scenario was important, at least in the first scenario. Um, but they didn't, you know, that first, the first iteration, we only ran scenario one. We did not see significant differences in that game than we did to other games. So we, we have a, a question on the scenarios. Uh, so if you could clarify whether players played one or both scenarios and how you would expand the game, um, how, how, how playing one affected what they did in, in the second. Great question, really important question. So we, um, we had two iterations that were just scenario one. Three, three iterations that were just scenario one. The rest of the iterations were scenario one and scenario two. We have never played the game with just scenario two because we believe that scenario one primes for scenario two. And so if they ran the scenario two without scenario one, we wouldn't consider those to be comparable. We'd have to throw out the results. Um, and actually sometimes people um, have said, hey, we've run scenario two, can I give you the data? And I say, no, I don't need it, don't, I don't even want to, no. <laughs> um, so that is really, really, really important. And you also played the games both virtually and in person. So did you find that the platform created barriers for player communication and coordination that had a substantial impact on the outcome of, of those response plans? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the virtual game outcomes don't look substantially different than the, um, than the in-person game outcomes, which is great. Um, but group dynamics were very different in those games. And that's something that we're trying to, to, to pull out right now in some work that we're doing. Um, interestingly enough, though virtual games took more time, uh, deliberative time, than the in-person games, 
and teams struggled with kind of the storming. I was I was in the Air Force, the storming, norming, forming, and they had trouble kind of building group dynamics in a short period of time on Zoom. Um, and so just anecdotally, what we saw from the facilitators, we saw kind of more um, either one person dominates completely or these like very strictly collaborative. So we actually think the virtual games, if anything, tended more to the average and more to the mean um, than other games, um, but we're still running the, the data right now. And we have per, uh, attendees that are interested in how communication worked between between uh, the different teams and whether you could use these games to understand inner competitor theory as, as an option to open up a potential space for improving cooperation between adversaries. I mean, was, was that communication um, Yeah, I mean, it's a one sided game. So not really, you know, um, we're, we weren't, you know, we were, we were not designed to kind of think about those relationships or to simulate, um, you know, I've been in games where we, we really are very interested in how kind of the introduction of diplomacy and different mechanisms from diplomacy within the game can lead to different outcomes. Um, here, diplomacy is just another kind of quiver in the arrow. And so you're not looking particularly at like the mechanisms that they're using to communicate, whether that changes their decision making. And, and do you think that your research has consequences to horizontal escalation um, as opposed to vertical escalation, which seems to be the primary focus here? Um, the game, that's kind of out of context for the game. As you saw the map, it's like other state, our state. Panelists really tried to pull in kind of alliances and um, you know in the times that I've been facilitator we did get questions about well, well what are my alliance options can I bring in my alliance partners and so there is definitely a focus on um, making this more of an international the, the players want intrinsically to make this more of an international game and less of just kind of an our state other state dyadic interaction um, but we don't include explicitly those other states for good reason, right? Like this, we are asking that we were trying to ask a very, very, very pointed question. And so the introduction of alliances and alliance structures is a very important and um, intervening variable that we actually try to control away from. And you talked about the difference in timing in the personal, in the in-person game and the virtual game, but do you think you can gain insights on the time criticality in decision-making? Uh, for example, when cyber attacks were an immediate need to, to respond to? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question, right? I mean, I think in general, trying to create a, a sense of immediacy is difficult in games that are not running time, I think. Um, others may disagree with me on that. Um, so, the time, the time pressure is in having to come together within, you know, an hour and a half and make a decision. Um, but whether each mean means, whether it's cyber or nuclear, creates different sense of urgency is not something that's explicitly um, simulated in the game because it's, it, it's canned, right? Like, Here's your scenario, write your response plan. You're given all the information at the same time. There's no, um, the injects are not provided kind of in time sensitive ways. So you're considering all of these options in the same kind of manner. And we have, we have a couple of questions on um, battle damage assessment and, and attribution and how this was represented in the game. I mean, did, did players have a good picture of, of whether the cyber exploit was, was successful? Yeah, so you know, we did not tell them whether their cyber exploit was successful. Um, what we gave them was the potential for BDA inside the treatment. So we're telling them kind of what's your percentage, not percentage, but like what's your likelihood of, of it working? What, how, what's the temporal characteristics? And then what's the likelihood of attribution? Now what's interesting is kind of how players, we give a little bit of a loosey-goosey on attribution, right? Uh, oh, you may be attributed, you may not, right? Same with the vulnerability. The vulnerability actually, you kind of give it attribution. Like you know other states, the one that's inside of your, uh, your um, systems, which is interesting because in general, players sometimes use attribution to do whatever tactic they already wanted to do. So they had attribution on the vulnerability, but in, you know, in some of the teams as response plans, we did get a little bit of hedging, like, oh, we're gonna wait for attribution there's no other player in the game. Like it's definitely other state, right? So they created uncertainty because they didn't want to respond to it, right? Um, but in the, um, in the exploits, 
we also give them uncertainty about whether they'll be attributed. And yet I found that when people wrote about it, they were more likely to talk about how it could be covert. And so when we give them the space inside the treatment to go whichever way they want with the attribution, I think it reveals something really interesting, interesting about we, how we as human beings parse the uncertainty about cyber operations. And I found that in my other research too, that the uncertainty that's associated with attribution provides an opportunity for individuals and states to revert to whatever the kind of core um, perception is. So if they're a revisionist or greedy state that wants to launch offensive operations, then you can use that uncertainty to create incentives for our retaliation. And if you're a status quo state that doesn't want to retaliate, then you can use that uncertainty about attribution to hedge. And this answers one of our other questions, which was how you found the uncertainty created by the vulnerabilities impacting aggressive strategies among, among the teams. Um, we do have another question on, on the types of um, nuclear capabilities in, uh, that were used. Uh, so was the usage of tactical nuclear capability explored between the teams in the asymmetric capability or, or otherwise? Yeah, we were not explicit. Um, we told them they had strategic resources. I think we may have told them that they had tactical resources as well. Um, interestingly enough, kind of as a facilitator, the only time this came up was when we, a lot, the only time we came up a lot was like when we were presented at Sandia. And I think the reason why it was such a big deal at Sandia was that it was an explicitly nuclear focused group. And um, so this was like the pony group. Um, so they've thought a lot about tactical nuclear weapons. This is an extremely apropos topic today. And then our group actually played Signal the day before they played our game, which is all about tactical nuclear weapons. So we had all sorts of like very um, in the weeds questions about like what level of weapons, uh, how you know big the weapons effects were on the, the ballistic uh, submarines. And we thought, <laughs> We don't need to go there, but it was really interesting. I mean, those people, that, that game brought its own level of expertise, which was very um, unique to the nuclear world. And we have a last series of questions regarding your, your future plans. Uh, one is uh, about, you know, whether you have a, a plan to shift from this one-on-one -on -one confrontation to a, a multi-sided multi one. Yeah, I mean, we would like to do multi-sided. We'd like to do multi-moves. I think I'm more interested in multi-moves than multi-sided um, because my research questions are not about interactions necessarily. So if I, my question is about signaling and the effectiveness of signaling, I absolutely need multiple sides, right? But if my question is about how people make um, decisions to use or not use cyber operations, then I can basically provide a one and a half sided game where um, if I have multi moves, I'm providing them with either kind of a, a base, you know, some sort of uh, rigid um, response. I think that's where we're leaning for the second series of games is to have kind of categories of responses based on the, the, the general um, play that we see in the first round um, and to use that to inform and adjudicate the second move. Because for me, this is a really fascinating question and trade-off between control and um, immersion. And I think if you're interested in escalation, you really do need to think about multi, multi moves. And so I'm interested kind of in how we can retain as much control as possible while also introducing this multi move. So we're working on that right now. As you can imagine, this is not easy. The other thing that we're um, that I'm working on with CSAC at Stanford um, is we are putting together right now a game series where we may do kind of a smaller number of games with high experts, right? Like so we spend a lot of time and attention on, on generating the right experts. And then we're actually working with some of the kind of top-notch artificial intelligence experts at Stanford to then take the results of our kind of smaller in but high expertise games and then run them um, without, um, with a kind of an algorithm um, over many, 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 many times to see, you know, kind of as a machine learning technique to see whether kind of we, when we simulate with, we simulate a large in um, how those behaviors that we find with the small in aggregate up. And you've, you've demonstrated the, the value of, of your work as, as an analytical tool, but do you think that these games can also be used to uh, advance 
stakeholder education and in mitigating cyber being presented as this this magic bullet uh, you know i um i do not usually use my games as a pedagogical tool and i certainly i do not use them as an experiential tool to teach a different policy outcome because i'm a researcher um but we know that games are strong experiential tools and um when i first got to the naval war college they had just run a private sector critical infrastructure game that i would call like uh, it was a it was a came a, a call to action game right the point of the game was to prove that cyber operations mattered to the navy or that cyber attacks against critical infrastructure mattered to the navy that's a very differently designed game than a, a game that has kind of an open question where you're equally interested in kind of whether the x happens or y happens so i generally do not use those but i understand that the strong strong experiential learning that you get from games can make them a really really effective policy learning tool and, and you have a number of, of additional activities in, in advancing wargaming as a social science. You have some uh, an article with, with Reed Polly. Could you talk a little bit more about how you see the, the evolution of, of wargaming in, in academia? Yeah, so I'm really excited about this because I think academia allows you to have a really long look at problems and to tease out things that maybe a sponsor wouldn't care about. I mean, so much of the development of, of wargaming within the practitioner community is driven by sponsor, usually substantial, substantive questions, right? They're not interested, you know, I mean, are they fun? Is, is Stratcom interested in whether you are, your data collection device is um, valid or biased or not? Not really. I'm like, that's not their role. That's not what they want to invest in, right? But but I can invest in this as a researcher and I can look at problems that maybe we don't have the time or the space to pay attention to within the really kind of problem-derived practitioner community. So I think that's a really like wonderful role for academia. But I think that in general, if games are going to be used in academia, we have to better under, have a better understanding of what are good games and what are bad games. Um, and then where there are potentials for a bias. Um, that make the results of the game less useful or less valid. And it's, you know, the community, the survey experiment community is already kind of, they have coalesced around what they consider to be good survey experiments and what are bad survey experiments. But that has not coalesced inside the wargaming community, at least within academia. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that will, um, that will build. I also hope that we'll be able to see more meta analysis across games coming from the academic community. Um, and you know, that's something that I think King's College is really building. I think CNAS is building. Um, we're gonna hopefully be doing some of this at Hoover too, to try and create repositories of data. And then I'm really pleased that we published the game design for this game and simulations and gaming first before the empirical work, because it allows for a lot of, um, a lot of, um, transparency. And um, I think transparency is really the important way to build this as kind of a, a discipline within academia. And, you know, we have a number of questions that pertain to the applicability of, of your research to, to other types of questions like propaganda, psychological operations, economic warfare. To what extent are those methods generalizable to, to other problems? Well, what we try to do with this game series is it's actually not a cyber game series. It's called the International Crisis War Game Series. And what we have tried to do in presenting this is to create a tabletop kind of um, option for people. And if you're interested in misinformation or political economics, you don't insert my cyber vulnerability treatment, you create your own treatment or your own kind of, you add on. And so what we've been, what we hope with this game series is that we've created a really kind of baseline that if people are interested in other subjects and other matters, they can introduce into the game or that they can modify within the game. Like if you're interested in multi-moves, multi-sides, great, take our like baseline and then build on it. And so that's what we hope we've, we've done is create something that can be iterated and changed and um, so that not everyone's having to build this stuff from scratch again, especially within academia where, you know, you really, and I think a lot of academics are approaching this from the very first time. It's, I think the, the audience that we have here, they just, you, you just know what wargaming is, right? Like, and so it's, you don't even need to describe it because you just know it is right how many games have you run you you know what works you know what doesn't 
that that doesn't translate to an academic community that's kind of never even seen these things run in person. So what I want to do and what I hope we do as a bridge is take these kind of these things that have been internalized within a gaming community that's played games for over and over and over again. And then we are able to say, well, what really is different about games? What can we prove? What can we not prove? And then taking it one step further, how can we um, how can we improve on some of the methods we have within games so that we know that they we know why they work not just oh, we know that works well in games but we know why it works in games i think that's something that that we in academia can do well this this has been fascinating and and people are really interested in where they can find out more about your work where where all of this is published so could you please uh, give us some direction on on where we can find those resources well, the the all the kind of baseline about this uh, game is called is in a an article called see I don't even know what it's called like we're gaming as an experiment anyway it's in the um, it's in simulations in gaming if you just like look up my name or my co-author's name is Ben Schechter, Rachel Schaefer, and then Wargaming and Experimental Methodology will show up there. Now the paper I just presented to you is at the beginning page, beginning stages of pre-publication, uh, of, of publication review at uh, journals. And so um, knowing academia, this will come out in two to three years if we're lucky. So um, <laughs> you'll be seeing a bunch of these papers show up two to three years from now. <laughs> Well, excellent. We, we look forward to that. And, and Jackie, thank you very much for, for joining us. I'll conclude with um, uh, thanking uh, also our, our organizers, Anna Nettleship and, and James Smith, who have um, uh, put our, are supporting this, this webinar series. Um, this talk will be available on YouTube. It will be, uh, re it's recorded and, and will be posted there shortly. It will also feature as um, as a podcast on the Wargaming Network's SoundCloud. Um, and please follow us on, on YouTube. Please follow us on, on SoundCloud. Uh, please sign up for the Wargaming Network mailing list. And we look forward to uh, seeing you in, in the future series.